Good morning, and welcome to our worship service at Winkler Berchtoller Mennonite Church on this November 15th. Again, we have uh, come to lockdown with this COVID pandemic. And so I invite you to uh, call on the Lord our God to hear our cry. And I want to read for us this morning as a call to worship Psalm 28. To you I call, O Lord my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift my hands toward your most holy place. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors and harbor malice in their hearts. Repay them for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done and bring back upon them what they deserve, since they show no regard for the works of the Lord and what his hands have done. He will tear them down and never build them up again. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in song. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. The emphasis of this psalm is not that COVID is our enemy, or that those who are uh, locking us down are our enemies. That is not the point of this psalm, but the point of reading it this morning is that we will call out to our God, the one who is our rock, our refuge, our savior, our shepherd. Let's turn to our announcements for this morning. Our missionaries of the week are K and K, Let's remember that they have recently moved within the country in which they serve. And so they're in a new neighborhood and may also be experiencing lockdowns and so on. So let's keep them in our prayers as they also are having to struggle with the effects of this pandemic. In the hospital this week, Irene Brown at the Boundary Trails Health Center and Tina Hildebrandt still at Swan Lake Hospital awaiting a spot at Salem. Two deaths to announce this week, not of our members, but of relatives of our members. Elma Dick of Winnipeg passed away on Wednesday, November 4th. A private family service was held on Thursday, November 12th. She was a sister to Len and Ann Penner. And Mary Ann Swanowski passed away Sunday, November 8th. A private service was held, and she was the daughter to Gertie Giesbrecht. Let's remember those families in our prayers. Our quarterly meeting that was planned for next week, I believe, has been canceled for now. So we'll have to wait and see when we have that opportunity again. And the nominations committee is looking for a few more willing servants. Please look at the bulletin for details. And we have uh, two names to announce this morning, uh, George Elias, and Gerhard Friesen have allowed their names to stand uh, to serve as deacons uh, for the next three years, and a vote will be held at a later date, again, when we have opportunity. So let's remember them also in our prayers. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the giver, the sustainer, and the redeemer of life. And we thank you, Father, that you have given us life through your Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed us from our sin and has granted to us reconciliation with you and eternal life. And Father, because of this, we are confident to come before you as your children, those who have been bought with the blood of your Son, and we lay our requests before you. Father, would you remember this morning our missionaries, I pray for them that you would remember them as they have recently moved. 
They're in a new neighborhood. They're also wrestling with the effects of this pandemic. Father, we pray that you would give them much wisdom and discernment as they try to figure out how they will do ministry in this new place under these new conditions. We pray that you would pour out your spirit on them, that they would sense your nearness and that they would be strengthened by your spirit. We pray also, Father, for those in our community who are on the front lines of this pandemic. Think especially of the doctors and the staff at the medical center. Thank you, Father, for their work. Thank you, Father, uh, for protecting them. And we pray that you would continue to do so, that you would keep them well. Father, we also pray for uh, the work of our church. Thank you for the many volunteers in the various ministries of this church who uh, roll up their sleeves and take to heart the task that is before them and do the work of this church. Thank you for them. We pray that you would bless them and help us to remember to encourage them when we encounter them. Father, we also thank you for our nominations committee and the work that they are doing. And we pray that you would answer their requests for, uh, for more nominees to step forward uh, or, be, uh, who's, or bring names brought forward of people who might be willing to serve. We ask that your hand would be in it. And then Father, also you know that our quarterly, meet, quarterly meeting and our deacon election has been postponed. I pray that you would have your hand on this body, that you would have your, um, that you would, that your spirit would be at work even as we are in separate places. Keep us as a body and keep us ready to serve one another and to love one another when we have opportunity. Father, we also pray for the sick. You know who they are. You know their struggles. And not only the ones that have been mentioned here this morning, but there are many that have not been mentioned. Father, you know the needs of each one in our, in our body. And I pray that you would meet their need, meet them where they're at, that you would grant healing, that you would grant relief, that you would grant restoration. And then, Father, we bring before you the families of those who grieve, the families of Elma Dick and Mary Ann Swinovsky. Thank you, Father, that death is not the end for those who believe in Jesus. And I pray that you would grant much comfort and peace and the unshakable joy of the Lord, even as they grieve, but remember that their loved ones are with you. Thank you, Father, for walking with us in all of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord and thus surround the throne and thus surround the throne we're marching to zion beautiful beautiful zion we're marching upward to zion the beautiful city of god let those refuse to sing who never knew our god but children of the heavenly king but children of the heavenly king may speak their joys abroad may speak their joys abroad we're marching to zion beautiful beautiful zion we're marching upward to zion the beautiful city of god the hill of zion yields a thousand sacred sweets before we reach the heavenly fields before we reach the heavenly fields or walk the golden streets or walk the golden streets we're marching to zion
Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, but with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay for the faith he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and And in fellowship sweet, we must sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in a Jesus but to trust and obey. Rise up, O oh man. with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Rise up, O men of God, his kingdom tarries long. Bring in the Oh, 
men of God, the church for you doth wait. Her strength unequal to her task, rise up and make her great. Lift high the cross of Christ, tread where his feet have trod, as brothers of the Son of Man, rise up, O men of God. Hello, it's so good to be with you today, children. Uh, we're back home again, but uh, we're happy today to sing some songs with you. Sing loud. At home, you don't have to worry about singing loudly. And I've got some wonderful helpers today who are going to help me with these songs. The B-I-B-L-E, the heart song, and Jesus Loves Me, all based in the Bible. So sing with us, the B-I-B-L-E. Ready, ladies? The B-I-B-L-E, yes, yes that's, that's the book for me. me. I stand alone on the world of God, the B-I-B-L-E. One more time. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And now the heart song. Maybe you remember this. My heart was black with sin until Jesus came and cleansed me up. My heart was black with sin until the Savior came in. His precious blood, I know, has washed me white as snow. White, white, white. And in God's word we're told We'll walk on streets of gold Oh, wonderful, wonderful day He washed my sin all the way Let's try that again, second chance My, start with the black My heart was black with sin until the Savior came in. His precious blood, I know, has washed me white as snow. And in God's word we're told, we'll walk on streets of gold. Oh, wonderful, wonderful day, he washed my sin all away. Thank you, ladies. That's a tough one to get those hearts turning, but you did a fantastic job. Let's sing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. One more time. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Great singing. Thank you. Have a good day. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is taken from Joshua chapter 24, the first 15 verses. So take your Bibles. I'm reading from the NIV. Joshua chapter 24. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. 
He summoned the elders, the leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from beyond from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. When I brought your forefathers out of Egypt, you came down to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the desert for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Girgashites, Hivites, Jebusites, but I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities which you did not build. And you live in them, and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord, and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your forefathers, that your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Harold Espinosa, and I'm excited to stand before you to share the word of God. The title of my message today is called, Are You Ready to Rise Above the Situation? I've got a few quotes here. One from Albert Moeller, who wrote a book called Conviction to lead. In the Bible, God has revealed the stories that underlines every true story and in which every other true story finds its meaning. Christians are not called to grow into faithfulness alone. The Christian life is to be to live within the fellowship and the accountability of a local congregation where the word is rightly preached and believers mature together. In that context, convictional intelligence emerges naturally along with those Christian intellectual habits, reflex, and intuitions we desperately need. D.L. Moody said, the Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. If our circumstances find us in God, we shall find God in all our circumstances. Today's passage is Joshua chapter 24, verse 1 through 15. I can imagine what it was like when Joshua went 
in front of the men, in front of men and women and children, called the leaders, and he had to talk and share what God has said. That must have been phenomenal. And even today, God speaks through the word of God. He shows us, he guides us through the Holy Spirit. And the question is, are we willing to rise above the situation that we are in today? So I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes with me as I pray. Lord and Father, I want to thank you so much for the amazing love that you have for each one of us and for the whole world. I thank you, Lord, for the word of God because the word of God is sharp. It pierces heart of man, the heart of man, and helps us to think deep. I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, for those who accepted you as personal Savior, that deposit that's put in our lives to help guide us, to help motivate us to live a life that honors you. Help me to say the words that you want me to say, not in my own strength, but in yours. And I thank you for the privilege of always being able to share the gospel, no matter where I am. So I ask you, Lord, that you help us to have an open heart to hear, to hear what the word of God has laid out, and that we be an encouragement one to another as we live in today's world. In Jesus' name, amen. In Joshua chapter 24, 1 through 15, I'm going to break it up into four points. The first one, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 1, Joshua speaks to the nations again through its leaders. And in verse 1, Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, the leaders, the judges, and the officials of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. In other words, Joshua and the people at Shechem, a town located approximately 30 miles or 50 kilometers north of Jerusalem, it was the last national assembly which took place in Silo in, eight, in uh, chapter 18, verse 1. Shechem is quite near to Mount Ebal, where Abraham had built an altar to Yahweh, found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 6 through 7. And as we see in verse 2, Joshua intends to address all the people. However, he summons Israel's leadership for the purpose of presenting themselves to God. He understands that people are not likely to remain faithful to the covenant if the leaders aren't faithful. During this time, we see brothers and sisters, we see so many things happening in this world. And, it easy, and it's very easy to blame people. And to say things like they're doing a terrible job or cut people down or just plain be mean. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14 verse 12, So then each of us will give an account for ourselves to God. It is easy to point fingers at others, but it's much harder to look in our own lives and to ask ourselves the question, What do I need to change for God? And Joshua, when he was standing before the people, he was sharing what God wanted them to know and to understand. This was very important. This was a time where he wanted everybody to think deep and to think, where's our relationship? with the Almighty God. And as Joshua was sharing, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 2 through 13, Joshua recounts the history of God's faithfulness to Israel. 
I could imagine if I was standing there with the crowd and looking and hearing Joshua speak. And when Joshua was recounting the past and God's powerful hand, I could imagine how awestruck the people were. In verse 2, this is what it says. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nabor, Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and give him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hills of country of Shear to Esau. But Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. God and his conversation, making sure the people understood the past. God did not talk about their failures instead, but God talked about his grace, his mercy, and his strength for them. These are the things that the people from Israel was listening and hearing intently. And in verse 7 it says, But they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of Jordan. And if we were to stop right there for a moment in verse 8, we could see how he was bringing them back to when God removed them from Egypt and how Pharaoh was so stubborn and wasn't willing to let God's people go. God knew all that. God knew what it took to get a hold of Pharaoh's heart. God knew what it took to motivate and encourage the people from Israel to rise and to follow God. And in Egypt, and going out to Egypt, yes, he did remind them there was a period of time that they were in the desert. I could imagine what they were thinking at that moment of why they were there in the desert. But God didn't stop there. He continued. In verse 8, he says, I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their lands. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent Balaam, the son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again. Constantly God was reminding them, the people of Israel, how he was with them and how he loves them and how he is guiding them each step of the way from Abraham to where they are today in that point of the scripture. And then he continues, he says, then you crossed the Jordan, came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gershites, the Hittites, and the Jubasites. That's a lot of ites, eh? <laughs> but I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you also, the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. 
God was showing and explaining each step of the way of how much grace and how much he stuck with Israel even when they complained, even when they looked for the negative, and even when they forgot God's almighty power. But God, in his message, what Joshua was talking to all the people, was just making it clear how much Israel meant to him. In other words, these verses continue the historical and reviewed that began in verse 2. It recalls of Egypt and the Exodus. It tells of Yahweh giving the Israelites victory over and over again. All the message was he is with them. That he's with Israel. And leading them each step of the way. In verse 11, it states, I delivered them into your hand. In other words, Yahweh concludes this review by saying, I gave you the land whereon you had not labored, and the cities which you built, you didn't build, and you lived in them. You eat of the vineyards. And the olive grows which you didn't plant. Yahweh is reminding the Israelites of how wonderful things that he has done for them in the past. Because of their history with Yahweh, they have good reasons to trust that he will do wonderful things for them in the future as well. If they are faithful to follow him. In other words, past memories can be very powerful. As we look, as I look back in the past, in my own life, I see how God's hand was at work in molding me, teaching me, and preparing me for the future task of following Christ, allowing discipleship to become valuable in my life, and to be a missionary at heart, serving the Lord, wherever he calls me to be. And just like you, in your circumstances, and your situations, and in mine, in mine, he sharpens and molds us each step of the way. Do we look for those lessons in the past? Do we look for God's hand in the things that happened in the past? Do we look for those answered prayers and talk about them? Do we look for what God has done in our lives so we can be a blessing to other people? Time and time again, I could share stories. Same as Victor, same with Pastor Dean, and many others that can share stories of time after time how God works through people's lives. I have seen young people, teenagers, when they realize who Jesus is and what he can do if we Give him that chance to be part of our life. A transformation in attitude. A transformation in their talk and their walk. Were they perfect? Absolutely not, because I'm not perfect, and neither are you. But what we do know that we have a choice to do our best for God. Just like when Israel was listening to Joshua about the past, they had to make a choice. They had to listen, and they had to decide what this message meant to them. So what is our choice today? To me, to remember the first time you heard the gospel, how powerful that would have been. The first time conviction came over our hearts for the need of a Savior, and we accepted him as our personal Savior. Myself and a, and a group of individuals from this church goes to Garden Park once a month. And it is an amazing place. When I go there and I sit down with a whole bunch of seniors and I ask them about their life when they met Jesus, 
I hear some powerful stories. How God used the Sunday school teacher to sit down with them and they told him about the story of Jesus and how he died on the cross and raised from the grave and he's not in that grave anymore. And how that individual was so touched by the Sunday school teacher investing in his or her life that they accepted Christ. I've heard of other stories where mom and dad was involved in their life And how mom sat down and talked to them and shared or dad shared the good news. And they were so excited. And they accepted Christ. And I've heard others who went to one of those big tent revival meetings. And they heard the preacher share the gospel. And they realized how much they needed Jesus. And Jesus got a hold of their life and changed them. I can go on and on on different stories of what people have shared. But they all have the same story. And that same story is they surrendered to God. God got a hold of their heart. They were willing to surrender in every which way to the best that they could. And God changed them. And God used him in mighty ways. To remember the stories that we have learned, like Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Moses, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, King David. To remember the examples of other people found in the word of God, like Paul, Peter, Martha. When Zacchaeus met Jesus, the Samaritan woman, and even Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ put the will of his Father first. Jesus is our ultimate example in the way we should live our life. But it is our choice. And do we want to rise above the situation of life today? In Joshua chapter 24, verse 14, that was what we would call the big challenge And that challenge was, are you ready to serve God? And in verse 13, this is what it says. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and the cities you did not build, and you lived in them, and eat from the vineyard, and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors. Worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Are we looking ways to find and build into people's lives at this moment? We have a food ministry here at the Winkler Bertaller Mennonite Church. And I am so excited with all the giving that people are giving to make it possible to help people in need today. Without volunteers and without you helping through the toonies and the loonies and whatever you give to reach out to people, we're sharing the gospel. We're demonstrating who Christ is. We're demonstrating Christ's love through our actions. We're calling people. We're encouraging people. And that's what we all need to do as believers. We need to start finding ways not to tear down, but to build up. In other words, in verse 14, now therefore fear Yahweh. In other words, fear the Lord. Sometimes people fear God because they have done something wrong and they fear the retribution But the fear of God often means something entirely different. Reverence and faith that leads to obedience. In other words, in Deuteronomy 6.13, the fear of the Lord is serving the Lord. In Deuteronomy 28.58, it is observing God's commandment. In Exodus 14.31, it is often the results of seeing God's power in action. In Joshua 24, 14, the fear of the Lord requires, sorry, that's in Acts 10, 22. The fear of the Lord requires righteousness. And in Joshua 24, 14, faithful serving to God 
the rejection of false God. And in Luke 1.50, the fear of the Lord ensures God's mercy. These are the things that describe what the fear of the Lord means. Reverence and faith that leads to obedience. In other words, the part that says serve him in sincerity. The Hebrew word is taman. And in truth, the Hebrew word is met. The word taman means to be complete, to finish, to conclude. In this verse, the word taman means serving God without exception. It means a life committed to God. The words it met means truth and faithfulness. Truth and faithfulness are the characteristic of God. So godly people need to manifest these virtues. Truth and faithfulness are different but related. A person who is faithful will not only tell the truth but will live the truth in their life. In other words, no matter what the circumstances is that we are dealing with, the question is, are we willing to rise above it in this situation? To be sincere in our walk with Christ. To be faithful in truth. When we say we know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, are we emulating Christ in our words and in our actions? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 22 through 37 through 38, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is a great and first commandment. When we choose to love God with everything we have, then we decide that we're willing to surrender God completely and allow him to change us from the inside. This means we will take the word of God and make it serious in our choices of life and how we live. The Bible says in Mark 12, 31, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So how are we reaching out to our neighbor? How are we reaching out to our families? How are we reaching out to the world? Are we complaining? Are we arguing? Are we fighting? Or are we looking ways to be able to build into people's lives, to encourage them, to inspire them, to help them look for ways to reach people for Christ or to walk with them in their journey and what they're going through? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17, Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, it says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of his calling, you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The Bible keeps continuing in 2 Timothy 1.10. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. The grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who have destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And the last part, choose God or choose your own desires. 
This was a powerful last verse as an ending to what he wanted people to understand, what Joshua wanted Israel to think deep on. This is what he said in verse 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the god of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The value of the church gathering together to prayer as and the importance of living your life and my life for Christ is essential for a believer in Christ. And even though we cannot gather due to restrictions by the government because of the dangers of C-19, we ought to be looking for ways to rise above this. How can we do it? By obeying these laws. We can encourage each other by calling, by going onto the internet, by writing a letter or an email. We're not limited to just stay home and do nothing. We can start praying for one another, calling the individual and saying, hey, what's on your heart? May I pray with you and then pray with them? Are we helping people out with compassion and love for Christ? Are we looking to be a blessing in people's life in all aspects, not for when it's convenient? Are we doing our best to be like Christ? I totally believe Joshua said it very well when he says, but if you're serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose yourself this day whom you will serve. There's a lot of people right now that need people. So are we willing to be what God has called us to be? Different. Jesus didn't go around complaining, throwing stones, being angry all the time. Instead, what Jesus did was pour into the disciples looked to be a blessing in people's lives, prayed with people, and helped people the best way he could. And as God, he could do anything, and he did. He did miracles, powerful miracles, and he empowered the disciples to do the same thing. What we need is a miracle. And what does that look like? That's you and I making a difference in people's lives by doing our very best to shine our light for Jesus like Jesus did all he did for us. He gave his life for us. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Bible makes it clear how much God loves you. Just like he loves Israel, he loves you and I too. In John 3.16, a lot of people have that memorized. And some have never heard this verse. For God so loved the world. That world is you and me. And we only have one world. The one that we're standing in. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah, I know things are upside down. And I know sometimes people are not being what they should be. But God, he's faithful, he's just, he's awesome. And he is our guide. He's the one that we look up to. And he's the one that is our example. So I'm encouraging you and me and all those who know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Let's rise above this and be a blessing in people's lives. And tell people about Jesus and how much Jesus loves them.
me, you, and the world. Bow your heads and close your eyes with me, please. Lord and Father, I thank you so much for your word. I know I'm not I know I'm not perfect and I have my faults. I know I have my struggles in life like everyone else. I do get discouraged as well. But I want to thank God for the word of God because that's what brings me excitement and hope. When myself and others get together when we can through video or through phone calls or through a ministry, how exciting it is to pour into people's lives. That brings encouragement. When we can cry with people in their situation and point to the one that can change them and that can help them, that brings excitement in my life, and I know it brings excitement in many others. So Lord, help us through this time to put a smile on our face and to look deeply at all the things that you have done from the past till now on how awesome of a God and a Savior you are. And that is what we share to the world, who you are and what you have done and what you will be doing because you are faithful all the time. And you're good all the time, even through every circumstance. And if someone doesn't know you, that tonight or today, this morning or this afternoon will be the time where they accept you as Savior. Heaven's an amazing place. And that's what we have as believers to hold on to, that if our time is up, we have a home prepared for us to be with you forever and ever. So thank you, Lord, for all you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to give a closing benediction. But before I do that, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Joining us at the service, turning on and praying for the pastors, praying for so many people from those that are working to the hospital and those that are in schools and those in many other areas trying to do their best through this time. Keep praying for them. Keep praying for the churches and keep telling the lost, witnessing and telling them how much Jesus loves them. So thank you so much for being a part of today. So let's pray. Lord and Father, we thank you so much for all that you are. And I thank you what you will do as we surrender ourselves to you. As we look deep into our heart intently to remember what you did and who you are. Help us to make the changes that need to be made so we can be a blessing to others today, tomorrow, and each day of our life. And thank you, Lord, that we could reach out through the internet, through Facebook, through YouTube, and so so many more different tools we can use to be a blessing and to be an encouragement to others. So help us as a body of believers to stand firm as one and to point to you and to make it very loud and clear. We love you. And you are awesome. Thank you for all you have done, God, and what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall to speak his name. Must I be carried to the skies on a flowery bed of ease while others fought
to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help If I would reign, increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Thy saints in all this glorious war shall conquer the Rise.